I lift up my eyes to the mountains. What is the source of my help? My help comes from Adonai, maker of heaven and earth. God will not let your foot give way. Your protector will not slumber. See, the protector of Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. God is your guardian. God is your protection at your right hand. The sun will not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. God will guard you from all harm. God will guard your soul. You're going and coming down forever. Adonai miyagur ba'ohalecha v'yishkon b'har kachecha. Olech tamim ufuel tzedek v'dover emet bilbavo. Who may abide in your house? Who may dwell in your holy mountain? Those who are upright and just, who speak the truth within their hearts, who do not slander others or wrong them or bring shame upon them, who scorn the lawless but honor those who revere God, who give their word and come up may do not retract, who do not exploit others, who do not take Rise, those who live in this way shall never be shaken. Tender as a father with his children, God is merciful with his worshipers. God knows how we are fashioned. God remembers that we are but dust. The days of man are as grass. He flourishes as a flower in the field. The wind passes over it and it is gone. God's compassion for his worshippers, God's righteousness to children, his children remain age after age. It is a fearful thing to love what death can touch. A 
fearful thing to love, oh, dream to be, to be, and to lose. A thing for fools this, and a holy thing, a holy thing to love. For your life has lived in me, your laugh once lifted me, your word is gifted to me. To remember this brings painful joy. It is a human thing, love, a holy thing, to love what death has touched. Even in our sorrow, God, we trust in your love. Therefore, we do not complain, for we know that you are righteous and your judgments are just. God, whose wisdom is infinite and in power supreme, you understand our needs. Help us to feel your presence in this time of our deepest sorrow that we may declare with perfect faith that God is upright, our rock in whom there is no unrighteousness. God has given, God has taken away. word has been uttered. The breathing has stopped. The beloved face freezes into a stare and is at peace. But we who are left behind know the dark yet, the grief and the confusion into which we are cast. Friends, we are gathered in loving remembrance. Joel was born on July 29, 1935, in Cincinnati, Ohio. The only child of Shachna and Brunetta Winston. He came from simple folk. His father was a milkman, and his mother a seamstress. And he was the center of their world. From his earliest days, he nurtured a love of Judaism, classical music, and football that would stay with him throughout his life. His love of trains, rural life, and raising sheep came later. <laughs> By the time he was in high school, however, Joel had become involved in Jewish life, had earned the respect of his peers, and risen into leadership as president of OFTI, the Ohio Valley, of Ohio Valley Federation of Temple Youth, and then as president of NIFTI, the National Federation. In 1957, Joel married Sandra Shaw. Together they raised two sons, Eric and Milan. Joel was a student of classics and Latin, and his studies took the family to live first in Israel, where he began his rabbinic studies, and then on a Fulbright scholarship to Greece, where he taught high school Greek. In between these overseas adventures, Joel and his family made their home in Cincinnati, where he became well known and respected as a teacher of advanced placement English in the honors program at Walnut Hills High School. During that time, 
Joel's passion for teaching became evident. But what was still unclear was whether it would manifest in a career as a teacher of classics to English, as a rabbi, or as a professional billiards player. <laughs> he was also an expert at No surprise then that he became a Jewish educator, serving as a synagogue educator at Wise Temple in Cincinnati. Always the student, however, <coughs> Joel pursued a doctorate in education at the University of Cincinnati during this period, doing research in moral development in early childhood. Joel's first marriage ended in divorce, and in 1981, Joel married Aileen after, and a loving partnership began that would last until and no doubt beyond his final breath. Aileen had come to Cincinnati from Pittsburgh and had been sent by a friend to apply for a job in the religious school at Wise Temple. Joel interviewed Aileen for the position and then informed her that he actually preferred someone else for the job. <laughs> but if that person didn't take it, then he would settle for Aileen. And the rest is history and her story too. Because it's almost impossible to think about Joel or talk about Joel without thinking or saying Joel and Aileen. Those who've been blessed to know Joel, to know them, understand how deeply Joel and Aileen were connected. There's a midrash that tells us that when a soul is created in heaven, it is hermaphrodite, that is both male and female. But since the way of earth is not the way of heaven, when the soul is sent down to earth, it is split into two. And the male part of the soul resides in the body of a man, and the female part of the soul resides in the body of a woman. And if they are blessed and deserving, the two of them find their way to each other. And in their coming together, that single soul created in heaven is reunited. It was as if Joel and Aileen shared a single soul. Even though they led separate professional lives and spent much of their day apart, they were always together. Their day began with breakfast on the screen in the porch, watching the birds. And it ended each night on the same screen in the porch, sharing glasses of wine. Joel was a true romantic. He loved Aileen with all of his being, so much so that he could never say no to anything she wanted to do. <laughs> Joel didn't really like going out to concerts and gatherings, and he was really quite shy and not much for socializing. But he would dutifully go wherever Aileen had planned for them to go. Together they covered southwestern Ontario. They knew every boutique hotel and every festival, but their favorites, of course, were the Stratford Festival and the Festival of the Sound. It was not unusual for Joel and Aileen to take seven hours to make the trip from Toronto to London. And at the other extreme, they were also known on occasion to make day trips to Ithaca or even Baltimore. Each year, like clockwork, they would head out to the one-of-a-kind show, where Aileen would spend hours lost in the marvel of the arts and crafts while Joel sat and read a book yeah. or marked term papers. But of course, he always enjoyed the concerts and festivals, and he loved to sit among friends nearly silently while Aileen carried the conversation. <laughs> Anyone who has had the pleasure has seen the wry smile that would come upon his face, or the rolled eyes and wrinkled brow that would appear when Aileen would be carrying on with one or another of her antics. But it was his true entertainment and his pleasure. She was his true love, and he was her biggest fan. He was a strong supporter of the Marymount Family Support and Crisis Center, where Aline has been the executive director for the past 17 years. Aileen brought with her to Joel her two sons, another Eric and John. Little Eric, as he's sometimes known, recalled that when 
Joel and Aileen got married. He and Jonathan needed something uh, to find something to call Joel, since Rabbi Witzstein didn't seem to work so well in that setting. <laughs> since Big Eric and uh, Ilan called Joel Abba, which is Hebrew for father, Eric and Jonathan chose Abba Bet, father number two. And that seemed to work out okay once Jonathan was old enough not to call him Olive Bet. <laughs> but Joel was father equally to all four of the boys, and he loved them all dearly, as well as their wives, Jane, Marion, Adrian, and Sarah. He loved to spend time with his grandchildren, Benjamin, Joshua, Jacob, Zachary, and Rebecca. He was so proud of them all, and he loved it when they came to spend time with him at the temple. And oh, how they loved him back. His carp, which little Eric left for Joel at the hospital a few weeks back, speaks for each and every one of them. My Abba, don't worry. This isn't some melodramatic, overly mushy poem about life journeys. It's just a thank you note. It's to thank you for teaching me that it's okay to be smart, but it's even better to possess wisdom. It's to thank you for continuing to be my role model, my moral compass, and the person I still strive to become. It's to thank you for demonstrating that nice guys can indeed do win at this crazy game of life. Please know that I love you more than words of the card can show. I'll see you again very soon. Love you. Although it was not a mushy poem, Joel would have appreciated it, even if it were. He had a love of poetry that went way back to the early years of his life. Joel had a particular fondness for the Hebrew poetry of Yehuda Amichai, especially on the theme of war and peace in Israel. Joel was a lover of Israel. He loved especially the temple trips to Israel. The quest for an equitable and honorable peace between Israelis and Palestinians was of the utmost importance to Joel, and I believe he would have wanted this Amichai poem to be shared this afternoon. Don't stop after beating the swords into plowshares. Don't stop. Go on beating and make musical instruments out of them. Whoever wants to make war again, Joel was an accomplished poet in his own right. He did not share his poetry often, but it was one of the many ways that this simple yet complicated man brought the imaginary and the romantic to life. Poetry was a manifestation of his love of the English language and its word images, of his imagination and romanticism. Poetry was also the vehicle through which Joel expressed that which was closest to his heart. His love of family, his deepest beliefs, his desire to see a better world, and a gentler fate for humanity. And it was also revealing as self-reflection. From an unpublished poem by Joel Winston. I do not bemoan my pasts. I merely stand in I do not reject my pasts. I merely struggle to embrace them. I do not glory in my pasts. The glories there are more than I can bear. I do not disregard my past. I see pain in the stains around me everywhere. Spawn in the stream of middle class life, the offering of two innocents groping toward tomorrow without a knowledge of today. My father, rich and black.
black scars and sour cream. My mother rich and bleed and hope to day of day. And they, the children of misplaced faith, he in a transplanted ghetto family that died upon the soil. She from a family long assimilated to American days and ways. Yet I do not bemoan my pasts and I do not reject my pasts. For behind this my stream flows my rivulets, and somewhere in perhaps one of them, in the fresh, clear water, cool from the earth, flowing, slowing, but surely into my being, I'll find something not merely to the sight, but something. Dear friends were so important to Joel and Amy. Joel enjoyed nothing more than the trips that they would take with friends, long trips to Eastern Europe, or short trips to Niagara on the Lake, or Toronto, or of course to Stratford. I first met Joel and Aileen in 1980 at a conference of the National Association of Temple Educators. Joel was president of NATO, a testimony to the respect that his colleagues in Jewish education paid to him. In fact, he and Eileen were so highly regarded as reformed Jewish educators for the creativity and dynamism that we have all come to know, that they were traveling all across North America doing seminars and in-service trainings. They were all the rage, and everyone wanted them to come. 1981, Joel and Aileen accepted jobs as educators at Temple Israel of West Bloomfield, Michigan, which was to be the last stop before they took a sabbatical from Jewish education and headed north to St. Ignace, Michigan, where they decided, of all things, to run a bed and breakfast. Every morning, Joel would get up before the sun to make his award-winning cinnamon rolls. No kidding. He actually won a National Bed and Breakfast Award. <laughs> I think it was in the Best Supporting Cinnamon Roll category. <laughs> this went on for a few years until Jonathan enrolled in a gun safety course, and they figured it was time to move on. <laughs> but something really important had happened during those years. Joel had been called upon by the local synagogue in Sault Ste. Marie to fill in during the illness of their rabbi. And despite his initial attempts to explain why a classical reform rabbi from Cincinnati might not be such a good fit for an old established and very orthodox synagogue, an amazing event occurred. Small town Jewry being what it is, and necessity being a mother led to enough accommodations, and Joel began to serve the Soon he was riding the circuit, also serving the needs of the congregation of Tasca. And out of all of this, Joel fell in love with the congregation of Rabbi, something that he had never imagined would happen. So when in 1987, Temple Israel was looking to hire its first rabbi, Joel Witzstein's resume found its way to London, Ontario. The way I heard the story was this. Karen Ross came to a meeting with the search committee, all excited. Good news, she cried. We have a resume. <laughs> bad news is, bad news is, he runs a bed and breakfast. <laughs> His greatest accomplishment seems to be cinnamon rolls. And he has two sons named Eric. <laughs>
the church that they converted in. We were kindred spirits. I'm honored by the trust that he has placed in me. My cup of life is a little bit empty for the loss. In Hilchot Talmud Torah, Rabbi Moses Maimonides, the Rambam, states, the Imcha Kavod, Kavod Gadol, Mikvod Harav, the Lo Morah, Ne Morah Harav, Amru Chachamim, Morah Harav, Kamorah Shemayim. There is no greater honor you possess and can display than the honor you possess and display for your Rabbi. And there is no reverence that you can possess and display than the reverence you possess and display toward your Rabbi. As our sages have said, the respect and awe you display toward your Rabbi is identical to that which you must display towards him. No Rabbi is more deserving of such honor than our beloved Rabbi John Winston. He will always be remembered first and foremost because he was a witch. Honorable and decent person, honest and straightforward, a person of complete integrity who spoke the truth and believed everything he said. As a rabbi, as in all other aspects of his life, he was a gentle soul, compassionate, caring, empathetic, and loving. Joel lived according to the ethics of our teaching. He lived the values that he taught. Be among the disciples of Aaron, loving peace and pursuing peace, loving your neighbors and drawing them near to talk. Do not say, when I have leisure, I shall study. You may never find the leisure I give. Say little and do much. person who brings pleasure to other human beings thereby brings delight to the Creator. Let the honor of others be as dear to you as your own. One who shames any person in public is not worthy of a share of its common. Who is wise, one who learns from others. Who is strong, one who controls his passions. Who is rich, one who rejoices in his portion. 